Good morning, everybody. Welcome for the first seminar colloquium from the IAA, Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía, here in Granada. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Ruben Sanchez Janssen from UK Astronomy Technology Center. And he will talk about the high multiplex and multi if IFU spectrograph for the ELT. So um, Ruben will be properly introduced by uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez. So Isabel. Thank you, Rene. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for being here for this, as Rene was saying, first uh, Severo Trial Colloquium of, of this year, 2024, Tech Profits, for wishing you a great new year, 2024, to you all here or uh, online. Uh, so thanks for being here. And uh, of course, thank you very much to uh, Dr. Ruben Sanchez Jansen for having accepted uh, our invitation to come here to provide us with this, uh, I'm sure, uh, successful uh, talk about Mosaic. Uh, Ruben Sanchez uh, uh, Jensen is an astronomer at the UK Astronomy Technology Centre in Edinburgh, um, and he's honorary fellow of the University of Edinburgh since 2021. Uh, Ruben graduated and received his PhD in, 20, uh, in 2009 from the University of La Laguna with a thesis project at the, at, at the ISC, the uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. After postdoctoral studies at uh, Chile, as uh, ESO Fellow and the uh, Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics in Canada with a, a Plasket Fellowship. He is currently astronomer, as I said, and project scientist at the UK Astronomy Te Technology Center, um, uh, which belongs or is, a, I don't exactly I don't know how it is, but from Science and like Technology Facilities Council, right? Uh, where he contributes to the development of scientific instrumentation and facilities for ground and space-based uh, astronomy from the ultraviolet to the near infrared with a particular emphasis on future missions. He is principal investigator of the UK, UK instrumentation program for the ELT as, as well as project scientist of Mosaic, uh, the multi-object multi spectrograph for the ELT. He has been PI for the UK contribution to CASTA, a proposed UV space observatory, also board and science team member for VT cubes the next high resolution uh, near ultraviolet uh, spectrograph, UK board member for the Mayuna Kea Spectroscope Explorer and the Wide Field Spectroscopic Telescope, and coordinator for the H2020 Optical Technology and Innovation Network. His research uh, program re revolves, uh, I love that word, um, around the evolution of galaxies, uh, with a particular focus on low mass galaxies and star cluster systems in the nearby universe. And uh, he's talking today about Mosaic, this high multiplex and multi IFU spectrograph for the extremely large telescope uh, from ESO. So thank you very much again, and the board is you. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Isabel, for such a, a nice introduction. Um, uh, and well, I wanted to start thanking uh, the, the Severo uh, program for the invitation, and of course, in particular, uh, Carolina Jorge and Pepe uh, for. Um, um, being uh, 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 the, the sponsors, let's say, for, for, for this visit. Um, and so, yeah, so today I wanted to introduce uh, Mosaic, um, which, as, as the title says, is, is the uh, um, uh, second generation instrument for the extremely large telescope, for ESO's extremely large telescope. Um, and um, um, basically, uh, I'm, I'm an instrument scientist and, and uh, co project samples for, for the project. Um, so, let's see, is this working now? It's not. Uh, um, does it matter? Uh, I'll move this. Yeah, I see here now. Let me see now. Now it moves. Right. So, uh, um, the ELT, in case you haven't seen it recently. Um, so uh, it's becoming pretty real, um, as you probably all, you all know. Um, it's a 39 meter aperture telescope segmented, uh, fully uh, adaptive optics uh, um, controlled. Um, and this is the status as of, uh, I think, uh, last month or so um, on Cerro Amazonas, about 40 kilometers from uh, Paraná Observatory in, in northern Chile. Uh, you can see how it's already progressing incredibly. Uh, you can see the dome. Um, um, so the ELT will see its first light 
Uh, right now, it's planned for uh, late 2028. Uh, that's that's the current uh, uh, um, schedule for for the telescope, and that basically makes it it's going to be the first of all the ELTs uh, way ahead of in, in, uh, the the US uh, TMT and GMT uh, uh, telescopes. Uh, so it's you know with a 39 meter aperture, it's going to completely uh, transform astronomy. Uh, especially in 2030, right, when we actually are going to be exploiting uh, this facility routinely. Um, and again, it's not only the aperture advantage, right, that gives you the, uh, you know, D-squared uh, sensitivity advantage, uh, but you got the D to the 4 advantage once you plug in the adaptive optics correction. So again, the ELT is, is a telescope that is fully adaptive. So the, the, the M4 um, is a fully adaptive uh, mirror. And so actually the telescope per se does not deliver uh, a scene, right? The image quality of the ELT is, is, is complete rubbish until you uh, turn on the AO and the deformable M4 mirror uh, starts operating. Um, so we all know that, you know, telescopes uh, are the way we collect the light, uh, but um, they're nothing without their, their instrumentation suite. And uh, the ELT has a very ambitious um, uh, instrumentation suite that matches the ambition, the ambition of, of a telescope per se. So why we are building a uh, mosaic? So um, the instrument has a number of very high level, top level requirements. The first one, perhaps the most obvious one, is to exploit the large field of view and collecting power of, of the ELT, right? So the ELT delivers um, a field of view uh, technical field of view of about 10 odd minutes. Um, but for the, from the first generation instruments, uh, this is the largest field of view um, that we'll have access to. So Mikado will provide a one by one square art minute imager, uh, long lens spectroscopy. But you can see how the rest of the AO corrected ELT field of view is entirely unused. Right, and this is basically where what what uh, is uh, the niche for a multi-object spectrograph. Um, then the other three main points uh, that drive the design of the instrument is that it has to provide uh, spectral coverage in both the visible and the near infrared. Uh, something that I'm not going to be putting a, a lot of emphasis on is um, the ELT coating. So the ELT is optimized for the infrared because that's where the AO correction is really, really significant. And so the coating uh, for the LT is optimized for the infrared, but extends all the way to the blue. Uh, but the first light instruments have a very clear focus on the infrared. So for the next generation, there was a clear drive from ESO to have instruments that extend as blue as possible. Uh, the other one is that it shall provide a number of resolving panels. Uh, and then also an, a mixture of modes, providing both high multiplex um, or a uh, relatively high spatial resolution to be able to resolve objects spatially, uh, not just uh, to collect uh, uh, the light. Um, so this is the, the ELT instrumentation suite in, let's say, parameter space, right? Um, uh, this is a plot from Susie Ramsey's uh, Messenger article. So here you've got spatial resolution in milliard seconds versus field of view of the instrument. And here you've got, we've got Mikado. Uh, which is an imager uh, and spectrograph. Uh, and you can see, as I said, this is the la la largest field of view of, of Mikado one by one square minutes. Uh, this is Harmony, the integral field spectrograph. Metis, the uh, mid infrared imager and spectrograph. And it says high resolution, it should be Andis now, uh, which is the high resolution spectrograph for the LT. And you can see how this is where Mosaic lives, right? So it's the coarser scales of the LT. Uh, because we are correcting for the full field of view, not a small area, uh, but the widest by far uh, etony of, of the telescope, right? Uh, so it's going to be a field of view around uh, 7.5 arc minutes in diameter uh, and, and unobscured. Um, and then in parameter space of wavelength coverage uh, versus resolving power, what I said before, we've got Mikado, which does uh, spectroscopy at intermediate resolution in the uh, near infrared mostly. METIS that focuses on this, on this mid infrared uh, regime, very niche for, for the ELT as well. Uh, again, should be Andes, not high res. 
Um, the visible and the IR a uh, single object, but a resolving power of 100,000. And then the parameter space for mosaic lives here. So a range of intermediate to uh, a low, let's say, of 5,000 to 20,000 resolving power in the visible from 0.39 to 1.8 microns. And this is where you see the complementarity of all the different uh, ELT instruments. Now, uh, to put a bit mosaic in context of other MOSC instruments, right? Because we're now living in this era where to do follow up large imaging surveys, uh, it and uh, becomes like kind of the driver parameter, right? Uh, and so on, on multiplex. So you can see here, you know, telescope diameter, in the x axis versus telescope multiplex, how many objects you can observe in one, uh, uh, in one pointing. Uh, of course, you know, the ideal is this diagonal, you want the largest possible aperture and the highest possible multiplex. But you can see where most uh, instruments that exist are either in operation or in construction, they live in this part of the parameter space. Uh, you know, we are in this four to four meter to eight meter class telescopes with multiplex of uh, a few thousands at most. Uh, uh, these are planned uh, instruments for the mid 2030s, mid 2040s. And you can see where the emphasis here is to have Again, eight meter, 10 meter class telescopes, but with very large multiplexes. And then we've got the instruments for the ELTs. And so it's clear that we cannot compete in terms of uh, uh, area uh, in, in the sky footprint uh, with, with the smaller telescopes that can have very fast optical designs. Uh, the actual advantage for the ELTs naturally is, is the aperture, right? It's the sensitivity. And there are two uh, very useful um, scaling relations, right? If you're observing in spectroscopy, um, a background-dominated source, you know, your limiting flux is inversely proportional uh, to your uh, telescope aperture, right? So if we compare, for example, the VLT with the ELTs, uh, you get a, an advantage of almost like, almost two magnitudes deeper uh, for a fixed exposure time, right? That gives you an increase in terms of the volume of objects that you can observe, the factor 10, right, uh, typically. Uh, but perhaps more interesting uh, for spectros spectroscopy is that if you go for a source-dominated observation, where right, you want to look for, a, for an object that is relatively bright, and what you want to do is, for example, relatively high spectral resolution, right? Because what you want is not just detect a fading feature, but you want to detect a feature at high signal to noise to do actually uh, precision abundances, for example. Then the limiting flux goes as the square of the telescope area. Right, so for relatively bright objects, mosaic and the ELT in particular are going to provide a, 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 a magnitude advantage of almost more than three magnitudes, right, at fixed exposure time compared to the VLT, right? That gives you, uh, for example, for a galactic studies, uh, uh, an increase of a hundred times more in terms of the volume that you can access with 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 an ELT. Um, so, who is the consortium? The consortium. Who is mosaic? Uh, who is building this instrument? Complex graph, I don't want you to uh, pay attention, but just to show you, you know, it's a really, really big project um, uh, that is led by France. France is the PI country, um, but it contains, it, it has 14 institutes from eight different countries. It's a huge consortium, basically because it's a very ambitious uh, uh, project that uh, it's gonna require a lot of resources. Um, so the PI is uh, uh, Rosette um, who a lot of people will, will know very well. Um, she's based at uh, the uh, in Marseille, in France, uh, and I want to highlight that she not only is the first uh, uh, female PI of an ELT instrument, she's the first ever female PI of a VLT instrument. Oh, uh, sorry, of an ESO project, which I think is something quite quite remarkable and for something we're quite proud of. So, uh, so this is Rosé is leading the project, um, and what I want to highlight, of course, is that uh, it's a really really big team. So the the science team. Um, is currently over 260 uh, members of the ESO community. Um, and uh, Mathieu Puech from Paris and myself are the project scientists. So we coordinate the, the development of the science case for, for Mosaic. And then the technical team is led by Eric Prieto, uh, who is the project manager, and uh, Miriam Rodriguez, who is the system engineer. Uh, and it's, it's uh, lots of different work packages, 
almost 90 people working to actually uh, uh, construct this uh, and build this, this instrument. And of course, I want to highlight the participation of the of, of Spain and in particular the, the institute here, the IAA, right? Uh, where uh, there's a big contribution and uh, together uh, in the electronics of the of the of the of the instrument. Um, and so um, I'll I'll talk about this this schedule later on. Um, so as I said, mosaic is a is a multi-purpose uh, um, instrument for the ELT, as most uh, 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 multi spectrographs are. Uh, this is not a surprise, right? And, and so in terms of the science, we are dividing the science in in six different science working groups. I'm going to go very very briefly over you know what are the science goals for these science working groups. Uh, but again, it's a workhorse instrument, right? The, uh, most uh, uh, multi orbit spectrographs are. So uh, the sorry yeah so the uh, the first science working group is on on first light uh, galaxies and reionization and of course I want to highlight here uh, the the role of of, of Carolina uh, who is actually uh, coordinating uh, uh, together with uh, Matt Hayes and, and Nicolas Laporte uh, this science working group and the goal here uh, is to actually uh, uh, basically constrain which are the the, the main sources that reionize uh, the the universe and to provide a physical characterization of these of these sources and how we're going to do that is through measurements of uh, metallic lines in the in the UV, in the rest of frame UV at high redshifts, uh, redshifts uh, uh, higher than seven, uh, not just emissions but also in absorption. Uh, thanks to the high sensitivity of, uh, provided by, by Mosaic, uh, to constrain the the the, the scape fraction, the Lyman continuum scape fraction, uh, and to characterize the properties of the of the ISM, uh, and to actually also, I think this is perhaps something relatively new, thanks to Webb, right? We've they, been finding AGN AGN at a uh, very high redshift, and so the idea of Mosaic will be also to actually follow up and provide a detailed detailed characterization of those AGN um, uh, and and their role uh, towards reionization. Um, science working group two, we call it inventory of matter, but it's what you would call basically tomography of the intergalactic medium and the circumgalactic medium. Uh, and the, the main survey right now is, is mapping of the cold gas distribution at redshifts of 3.5 more or less on megaparsec scales uh, by uh, doing line, quasar line of sights and reconstructed, reconstructing the Lima Alpha uh, forest. And so you can provide uh, uh, reconstruct through tomography uh, basically the three dimensional distribution of the uh, neutral gas uh, at this at these redshifts. Um, and and uh, the the niche here for mosaic is is this uh, you cannot cover again area, but you can go very deep. So it's an entirely different redshift range than uh, um, most instruments can do a redshift of two more or less. Um, Third science working group is on galaxy evolution and mass assembly. Um, so the idea here is basically just to actually constrain uh, the growth of galaxies at, at let's say, um, uh, uh, a high, uh, higher uh, high loopback times. Um, here, I'll go again, three three main uh, main science cases, uh, the environmental large scale structure of uh, high redshift galaxies, uh, the properties of the ISM and the evolution of the stellar populations, uh, um, and then the uh, the last one is the emphasis uh, on the study of uh, sub L star relatively low mass galaxies at redshifts uh, two to four. And here, this science working group has a big component uh, using the IFUs. The idea here is to do uh, a survey of hundreds of galaxies at redshifts two to four with spatially resolved information, so data cubes using the multi IFUs. Um, for for a, a relatively large sample of objects um, uh, to go beyond just the number of statistics and the integrated properties. Um, so science working group four is galactic archaeology, um, and the main the main emphasis here again we have a relatively small area, so we cannot really do galactic archaeology per se. We're not going to cover the entire uh, uh, galactic halo because we don't have enough area. So here it's more uh, selecting. Um, low mass uh, galaxies and star clusters, these low mass regime, the divide uh, between the star clusters and, and low mass galaxies, the ultra faint dwarfs, and to be able to do uh, precision spectroscopy down to the main sequence. So this is an example of an ultra faint dwarf galaxy here, for example, this is Rekha 2. Uh, so this galaxy uh, has a total luminosity of 300 solar luminosities, right? It's really, 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 really faint. And basically uh, there are about, about seven stars in the red giant branch of this object, right? So you cannot say much 
uh, you cannot say anything about this, the, the intrinsic metallicity, the metallicity spread of this object. So you have to go down uh, to the main sequence to be able to do this. And you can see the magnitudes here. If you want spectroscopy of you know tens or hundreds of stars for this object, you need to go to 23rd, 24th magnitude, right? And you need an ELT to do that. And also, same thing with the inner galaxy, the obscured galaxy, going to uh, study uh, star clusters uh, in the inner galaxy. And of course, then the sensitivity of, of, of the ELT is what gives you the depth and going well, uh, peeling into the dust uh, regime and peeling into the into the, the bulge. Um, <clears throat> stellar populations beyond the local group. So let's say local volume. Um, uh, again, there are a few uh, uh, key science cases. Spectroscopy of individual O-type stars out to uh, five megapar, more or less five megaparsecs, the sculptor group, for example, and this is more or less the signal to noise that you can obtain spectra uh, for an O-type o type star. And you can see that all the way to five megaparsecs, you're over 30 and signal to noise ratio. Um, uh, so you can actually characterize the physical properties of these massive stars out to five megaparsecs, same red supergiants out to more or less tens of megaparsecs, distances like very good cluster, uh, and especially Fornix in the south. And then also young superstar clusters, two distances more like, you know, coma, 100 megaparsecs. And finally, there's one science working group that is a, a relatively new one. And actually we have not developed the case and it's not a driver for the design of the instrument, which is transients and multi-messenger astronomy, right? Um, this is a very key science case going forward. Uh, and so we have a, a science working group that is small right now, but they're starting to look in, in what way uh, could Mosaic contribute um, to actually following up spectroscopically uh, uh, faint transients, right, in, in the era of, of uh, Rubin and SST, for example, right? Uh, and the idea here, or, or even, you know, uh, Lisa uh, uh, in, the, in the late 2030s, um, and the idea here is that Mosaic would provide spectroscopic characterizations of the environments, of the host galaxies and the environments um, of, of uh, transients, uh, energetic transients. Uh, so these are the six science working groups um, that uh, we are um, uh, uh, working uh, and we're, um, with which we are developing the case. Um, and so, but I haven't actually mentioned what is Mosaic uh, in detail, right? What is the instrument? How are we gonna actually build the instrument? And I guess this is just the, 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 the simple way of, of showing it. Um, so it, 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 the design of Mosaic is, is a very modular instrument. I was, it was built like that in, in purpose. And the idea here is that we deliver three different observing modes that can be uh, used in, in parallel. So basically we got light from the ELT. We have an adaptive optic system. Then we have a, a complex focal plane that delivers three different types of, uh, of observations. As I mentioned, so we do a multi spectroscopy in the visible and we feed with fibers a visible spectrograph. Uh, we can in parallel do uh, multi spectroscopy in the infrared because with fibers, we feed an infrared spectrograph. So uh, at, the, at the platform, at the nascent platform of the ELT, there will be two separate spectrographs, an infrared and a visible. And then we have uh, these multi-IFUs that only operate in the infrared because they want to resolve uh, um, spatially objects. And the AO correction is only good enough in the infrared to do so. And uh, they share a spectrograph with the MOS, right? So the idea is that we provide this the different uh, capabilities to the community uh, that is flexible and that uh, lots of different science cases can benefit from. Um, so I'm gonna go over uh, just a few bit of details of these uh, different subsystems. I'm not gonna talk about the spectrographs. Uh, the infrared spectrograph is an evolution of the uh, moon's VLT moon spectrograph. And the VIS spectrograph is an evolution of the uh, one for foremost on, on, on Paraná. Um, but I wanted to highlight, for example, that um, the idea of the AO is basically that we're going to provide a seeing improver. Again, we are not providing very, uh, let's say, diffraction limit uh, correction, because you can only do that over very small fields of view. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the, the, the field of view of uh, Harmony, uh, which is a first light integral field spectrograph, um, when uh, at, at its uh, a diffraction limit uh, regime is uh, less than two arc seconds, right? So you can only correct to the diffraction limit very, very small spatial scales. Mosaic, on the other hand, is going to be correcting a field of view of 7.5 arc minutes, right? So the quality of the correction uh, has to be, uh, by, by necessity, quite small. So the correction is going to be ground layer adaptive optics. It's basically ground layer tomography. And what you do is that you use four lasers and three natural guide stars 
to correct for full tip, tip, tip tilt correction uh, and higher order corrections across the entire Philippines. So basically, just to give you an idea, what Mosaic will do is that in the visible uh, below, let's say, 6,000 ang angstroms, you will get an image quality that is similar to what you would get in terms of uh, just the seeing. It's not the seeing, but it's kind of in terms of the scale, it's going to be similar. Uh, in the infrared, all the way to the H band, which is our uh, reddest band, uh, then the full width at maximum would be more like 0.3 arc seconds, something like that, right? So again, it's it's just a seeing improver, just, but it, you are correcting the full field of view or, or of the ELT to be able to 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 do so. The focal plane is is very very complex. I don't going to want go no more go into the details, but basically this is the ten minute field of view technical field of view of the, of the ELT. So we provide um, uh, science over 7.5 minutes in diameter. Uh, these are the cutouts for the laser guide stars that I mentioned before. So this area we cannot use, these four laser guide stars. And you can see here, there's these little tiles. So in, in these tiles is where the positioners live. And we have 300 of those in the focal plane. So we can have up to 300 positioners here operating simultaneously. Uh, the positioners is a very novel concept. And again, I don't want to go into the details, uh, but this is how they look like. They're quite chunky, um, uh, but we have you know prototypes already. Uh, the main idea here is that you get the light from here at the top. You have an optical relay system. Uh, you have an atmospheric disper uh, dispersion compensator to be able to uh, um, uh, get the light uh, into one spot and, and not have differential losses. And at the bottom of all this complex mechanism is where the fiber bundle uh, is, is going to live to actually collect the light and bring it through fibers um, onto, onto the spectrograph. Um, so I said fiber bundle because when I say fibers, we don't have fibers, we have bundles. So for every visible and infrared MOS uh, at low resolution, um, we have a bundle of seven hexagonal objects together. The reason why this fragmentation is needed is because the, the ELT has a very light, large plate scale. It's 3.3 millimeters per, per arc second, right? And so you cannot actually build a fiber that is big enough to actually collect all the light from a PSF. Um, uh, and so you have to fragment it. And so every object is going to be mapped by seven different objects. Uh, and also this makes the design of the spectrograph much smaller because the size of your slit uh, and your optics uh, is divided by, by the, you know, it's determined by the size of one of these fibers and not the entire bundle. But basically, uh, um, I'll, I'll go over the numbers. These numbers are not very accurate because of recent uh, revision of the of the um, of the design uh, i'll show uh, the numbers in detail but the idea here is that you have uh, several hundred of the visible uh, and the um, uh, infrared moss uh, uh, bundles the high resolution in the visible uh, uh, you actually have to you have to slice even further because you actually the only way of reaching the resolving powers that we need is to reduce your entrance lead further, right? And so this is why you can see that these bundles are smaller than these ones. It's just to increase the uh, uh, the resolution, uh, spectral resolving power. And then the IFU uh, has a, a I'll show you there. They're going to be it's going to be eight of them. Uh, the aperture is not two point five, two point two arc seconds in diameter. Um, with a spectral size of 150 million seconds. And you can deploy those uh, across the entire 7.5 minute field of view. Um, so this is actually the modes that we have in Mosaic and the multiplex. So as I said, we have the two most modes. Mm -hmm. So we have one visible spectrograph. Um, and here we go from 390 nanometers all the way to 950 in one shot. Uh, I'll, I'll show. I'll, I'll have something about the, the spectral settings with uh, bigger fonts, uh, and then in parallel, you can do the infrared from 950 to 1.8. When I say in parallel, is that you do it on the same focal plane, but it's not on the same object. It's different positioners that are feeding the visible and the infrared spectrograph. <laughs> they can they live together on the focal plane, but you're using the two spectrographs simultaneously. Um, and this is also in one shot um, from 950 to one, uh, 180. In terms of multiplex, how many objects you can observe? 
In the visible at low resolution, it's 140 with a subfield diameter, this diameter here, of 0.7 arc seconds. Um, at a higher resolution, it's also 0.7, but we have a lower multiplex because we have more fibers per object. Um, and in the infrared, uh, both low and high resolution is 200 objects uh, with 0.6 arc seconds in diameter. Then the IFUs, as I said, there's going to be eight of them. Uh, and this is the number is really limited by the number of detectors that we can afford. Basically, it's how many pixels we have uh, available. It's eight of them. The field of view is going to be 2.2 arc seconds in diameter. That's the longest direction of this hexagon. Um, sample at 150 milli arc seconds. I mentioned that uh, the PSF is going to be more or less uh, a full width of 0.3 arc seconds. So we are kind of like critically sampling that, that PSF with this uh, uh, Spaxel scale. Um, and so again, spectral settings, perhaps what people are more interested. As I said, so in one shot, we get uh, 390 to 950 uh, in the visible at resolutions, I said larger than 4,000. So the medium resolution is more like 5,000. Um, and then we have, for, it's a two arm spectrograph. So we also have, um, on one of the cameras, we're gonna have two high resolution ratings and the other camera is gonna have two, uh, also two high resolution ratings to cover these spectral ranges at a resolution of more or less 18,000. Uh, that's uh, mostly for galactic studies, but you see that we can cover from the very blue uh, all the way to more or less the calcium triplet um, at a resolution of 18,000. And as I said, the full visible in one shot um, in, in uh, at a resolution of more or less 5,000. Um, in terms of the um, infrared, yeah, right. So this is the infrared. Uh, so I didn't show you, but this dash lines here are the requirements of the of of the of the instrument, and the, the lines are what we achieve. So we are above the requirement all, all the time. Uh, so this is the infrared, nine fifty to one point eight in one shot at low resolution again of about five thousand, and then just one high resolution band at about 1.6 in the H band, which is kind of the apogee uh, band, again, mostly for, for galactic studies at a resolution of about 18,000. Um, so I'm getting close to, to, to finishing. Uh, just, you know, when uh, the, 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 the timeline for the development. Uh, so right now the instrument is in, in its phase of uh, preliminary design. Uh, we started um, earlier this year. Um, and we expect to complete, so this is a technically paced schedule, um, and we expect to complete it uh, around uh, 2025. Uh, we have a very critical point, which is called the funding review in 2026, when the consortium has to demonstrate that we actually have the funding to ESO, uh, 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 that we can build the instrument. And this is critical in 2026, because that's when we actually are gonna design, uh, decide what we can build. Basically, right. Uh, for for us to be able to build what, what I've been showing you, you have to go to ESO and say, "I've got the funding to do that." If we don't, that's where the difficult discussion about these scopes is going to take place. Um, then the final design re uh, the final design review is in twenty twenty eight uh, at the beginning of twenty twenty eight, uh, and then we have a four year final construction, very aggressive schedule. Uh, to be able to have what we call the preliminary acceptance Europe, which is we assemble the instrument, uh, we test it in, in France, and, and uh, ESO gives us the green light to ship it to Chile. Uh, that's in 2032. And then in early 2034, the instrument goes to the ELT, it gets plugged and installed on the Naismith platform, and we commission it. And ideally, if all goes well, uh, by uh, uh, you know mid 2034, we start doing uh, commissioning and science verification, and we start with the um, uh, guaranteed time observation surveys. I didn't mention it. Uh, of course, the way ESO pays the consortium um, uh, for all the uh, contribution in terms of both hard hardware and, and and effort is in terms of GTO guaranteed time observations, and uh, we are looking at getting around 130 nights, even though that, that's still to be negotiated, uh, spread over eight years. Um, and that's just for the consortium, right? So that's 130 nights that belong to the consortium to carry out a number of surveys that we are actually working to define right now 
within the science work uh, within the science working groups and the science team together with of course the the mosaic boy board um so yeah you can see there it's you know 10 years uh, ahead of us at least uh, worth of work uh, but this is what you know this these very complex instruments take basically um and so this is just my my uh, last uh, slide and uh, again just just you know the take home message here is that mosaic will really excel at very deep uh, pencil beam surveys, right? We're going back to fields of view comparable to what we used to have on the uh, even four meter telescopes and even force like on the on the ELT, right? Teller means at, at most, but of course very very deep high sensitivity. Uh, um, and so of course the the niche for mosaic is faint sources, right? Going after those faint sources or relatively brighter sources at, at a relatively high spectral resolving power, uh, but providing very high survey speeds. Um, um, so the idea here is to uh, open new parameter space and actually provide spectroscopic follow-up uh, to all these new facilities that are going to be uh, doing, uh, you know, imaging and and uh, uh, and uh, radio uh, uh, surveys of the of the of the sky, right? And and Mosaic will be like the go-to instrument to follow up these very faint sources um, um, that are going to be discovered in the next decade or so. Um, and that's me. I can take questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruben, for this uh, wonderful talk. So now the talk is open for questions. Please, in the room, maybe Jorge or Carolina, if you, you want to manage the questions, go on, please. Thank you, Ruben, for this nice talk. We have time for questions. Yes. So multiplex just means how many individual objects you're going to be able to observe in one shot, right? So when I say multiplex of 200, it means that you can observe 200 objects, but but the light is, it's, it's if it, you have to think as if it was just one fiber. So it's spatially unresolved. You don't have special information for those 200 objects, right? You get an integrated spectrum for those objects, even though I showed you that the bundle is gonna have seven uh, different, you don't have special information for those uh, seven bundles. Um, you have special information for eight objects that the multi-IFU, uh, that's uh, similar to VLT cables, right? So you deploy eight mini IFUs, over the field of view, and for those eight objects, you do have special result information at a spatial size of 0 0.15 arc seconds. Those are the two modes in the infrared, correct. So we, we have more or less 100, so, sorry, 200 objects without special information in the infrared, or eight objects with special information. And then in the visible, it's 140 objects if you're doing low resolution, uh, low re resolution, or 85 objects if you're doing high resolution. So that that's that's part of the complexity of mosaic, which is uh, the parameter space of, of different configurations is very large. And you know, agreeing with the community and with ISO in which direction we should push, uh, it's taken us years, right? Because you can optimize in very different ways, right? Um, but um, but yeah, that that's where we are right now with the design, and I think that's that's where we're going to go ahead with. Thank you. 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 Yes. I mean, you have to skip it in some way and make sure to yes. manage to, to yes. Yes. Correct. Correct. Um, th there are there are two reasons: one scientific and one uh practical. I would say for that, and that is a bit historical. Um, the the scientific was the scientific one was that of course you know everyone knows that if you get you know if you get the spectrum. Um, uh, if it's in one shot, it's easier because you have the full spectrum, and then you can you have more discovery space, right? But we did not have a single case, a single science driver that required the full coverage from 0.39 to 1.8, right? 
when, when we were actually driving the requirements and translating them into technical specifications, there was no particular case that required that full coverage. But the practical one was that Mosaic up until early this year, oh, sorry, last year, 2023, uh, did not have an atmospheric dispersion compensator, right? And the reason was that when we had looked into it, um, basically it's huge relay optics to be able to have a, 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 a basically a, a, an ADC, right? Uh, what I'm main, what I'm, when I, sorry, what I mean with huge is that the, the relay system to do this thing was three mirrors of two, uh, of, of two meters each at the platform. So it was just crazy, right? They just, we just couldn't build it. And if you don't have an ADC, you can have differential losses, right? Because you cannot track the parallactic angle. So you are, if you observe an object with a relatively small fiber bundle of a small aperture, dispersion, atmospheric dispersion is big enough that you either lose the light on the on the visible or you lose it in the infrared, right? You cannot optimize. And so of course that drove us into having this design where we had different spectrographs and you were you could observe simultaneously, but not uh, uh, sorry in parallel, but not simultaneously. Now there is I did show you very quickly uh, the, the the new thing you know what what's been new is that now the ADC this is a very novel concept. Now the aid the atmospheric dispersion compensator leaves locally behind the positioner, so we can have two hundred so two hundred sorry three hundred positioners on the focal plane. And behind each of these, there's going to be these sets of prisms, right behind them. So there's going to be 600 of those providing local correction of atmospheric dispersion behind the focal plane, right at the back of the here is where the ADC is going to live. So now we can provide um, uh, this atmospheric dispersion. Now the issue here is that if you were to do the full multiplex. Right, the 300 objects simultaneously in the vis and in the near, then we will also need much bigger spectrographs because we will need more pixels on the detectors to accommodate the 300. Right, so that's why we, in the end we got to a compromise where we said, okay, we can observe in the visible and and in the infrared simultaneous uh, in parallel in the sense that you know no spectrograph is sitting there idle, so we're collecting all photons, but it's different objects. So if for one object you want the full spectrum, then you have to you know, finish your integration and then swap, right? And you say, okay, I observe 150 objects in, with visible 200 with infrared now, and then I swap and I do the 200 that I did with infrared, I do now with the visible, but it's in two shots, not in one. So that's, that's a disadvantage, but it was a compromise that we had to, to reach to be able to provide both the multiplex uh, and, and the spectral coverage. Uh, so the ADC, this atmospheric dispersion compensator, is the one thing that is allowing us to do is allowing us to do the visible in one shot. Without the ADC, atmospheric dispersion losses were so bad that in the previous incarnation of the design, the visible was done in three bands. So not even the visible was simultaneous. We had to observe first the blue, then the green, then the red to just get one visible spectrum. Uh, because the losses were were significant, and so this is a huge improvement because now you get. Oh, what, what do you mean by several? Yes. I thought I would say people can say because no, yeah, no, I, I wish, but but the problem is that uh for air masses of you know more than 1.3, um atmospheric dispersion, blue to red atmospheric dispersion is big enough that the PSF spot is bigger than the bundle. Right? So so you would get the, the, the blue PSF would be here and the red PSF would be here and the green one will be in the middle. So uh, the problem is again, that the bundle is quite small, it's 0.7 arc seconds. The reason again being that the, the plate scale of the ELT is so large that if we wanted to have a, 
uh, a bundle of you know one arc second, which is what we actually wanted to get you know all the light, then you would have to add another uh, ring, uh, and that decreases the multiplex because in the end it's it's traces on the on the detector that you have to remove. So it's it's this trade off between you know it's a difficult trade off, right? How how much how much of the PCF spot you cover, how much objects you got, how much spectral coverage you got. So yeah. Thank you very much. Impressive instrument. I don't know if you about the immediate uh, thing. I don't know if the design of the object is well advanced. Um, I mean, are they fixed in the orientation or they have different? I mean, I'm sure they are aware about the difficulties of the illumination with the um, when they do the different different. So, can you explain a bit of this? Yes, so so that's basically um, um, that's a real difficulty. Uh, there are so the IFU have several uh, difficulties, um, especially uh, precisely for what you said, dithering and going uh, stacking, right? Repeat observations, particular if you're going to faint objects. Let's say you want to integrate twenty hours on one source because it's you know a very high redshift galaxy and you want the IFU um, controlling. Um, the positioning of the IFU is very difficult because the plate scale of the ELT varies quite a lot on small timescales, right? And so making sure that you are pointing on, uh, where you think you're pointing to be able to actually blindly stack your data cube, uh, it's one of the most difficult things that um, we are facing. And actually, to be honest, we we are not there yet in terms of demonstrating that we can achieve that, right? There's a lot of simulations because the, the problem with the ELT uh, for a MOS instrument in particular is that, as I said, it's a fully AO telescope. And this is the first time ever, right, that we build instruments that depend so much on the AO system. Everything, the guiding, the acquisition, the pointing, everything depends on what the AO can achieve. Right, that's that's why we're so heavy on the AO, right? You see, you see the the design of the focal plane, right? And it's crazy that you have four lasers, three guide stars, uh, and that's to precisely control the plate scale very well to be able to know, uh, you know, the absolute uh, world world coordinate system to make sure that again you go back the following night or three nights later and you actually you're positioning. But to answer your question, we have no control about the rotation, unfortunately. We, we think we're going to be able to control where we point, but the actual location uh, rotation of the hexagon. Uh, and so uh, this, and then reconstruction, uh, PSF reconstruction, given this difficulty of the PSF varying. So again, the PSF of, of this AO system uh, on time scales of typical integration times of 300 seconds, it varies. It's not a very nice, well-behaved, PSF, right? So we're still working, and actually, you know, people like you guys that are experts on on IFU data, we're gonna actually need input from you to actually decide, you know, how is gonna be the way that we're actually gonna be reconstructing these data cubes and knowing what PSF uh, we're, we're actually getting uh, on 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 the on the actual data. So uh, there's there's challenges there. Uh, the IFU adds. It adds a level of complexity, right? Because again, it's not just one MOS instrument. It's a MOS and a multi-IFU together. And it's, a, it's pushing the design and the requirements in different directions. So uh, a lot of work for us to, 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 to do. And I think that demonstrating before final design that we have achieved this, this precision that we can go blindly to a location and, and again, as, as, as you said, integrate for 20 hours, uh, it's gonna be difficult. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> we'll need it, yes. Hi, Ruben. Uh, thanks for this very much on the talk. Um, I have a different kind of question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the situation now of the whole project regarding the agreement with this or, or the next phase of construction? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's a very important question, and as you know, people that have been involved and in here, people that have been involved for a while, they, they know that you know we we it's taken us quite a lot of time uh, to actually get started with phase B in particular, 
uh, phase A was was finalized in, in 2018, and phase A was only uh, started uh, last year. So it took it took a lot. So right now, um, we have an agreement with ESO. And so this phase B has been split for the first time ever in two different phases. Um, and we are in this thing called phase B1, which um, ends with this milestone, this, this review, it's called the specification and architecture review that we're having in September this year. Um, and that one is basically ESO want to make sure that, um, you know, the architecture is sound um, and that we've flown down specification into different subsystems uh, um, adequately. Now, after that, we need to agree with ESO and ESO have to go to council to get approval to go into phase B2 that brings us into this final phase, which is the, the preliminary design review, right? So, we are pushing very hard to ESO, uh, uh, we're pushing ESO very hard to, to you know, guarantee that once we have passed the, the SAR, this is specification architecture review, we go into the next phase quickly. For example, Andes, which is the high resolution spectrograph, uh, it's also a second generation instrument like Mosaic, but they started before. Um, they, ha they had already a more mature concept. So they passed their SAR back in September, October. And we have they, they have been given uh, the, the green light uh, by ESO to start this phase B2 soon in 2024. It's not still specified the exact date. Um, so the problem is that ESO are really lacking resources. So ESO don't have enough people to follow up these projects together with the first light instruments uh, um, so as a reminder, uh, technically, there's four first light instruments, right, uh, for ESO, because one of them is is, is uh, Morfeo, which is the adaptive optics facility, right, which is considered an instrument, even though it's not doing science per se, it's just a, an enabler to, to, to the other instruments. Uh, and so um, ESO are really lacking resources to follow up these projects properly, right? So on the one hand, there's this tension, ESO would like us to go a bit more slowly, the consortia, you know, now that we're not once we're in phase B, we want to go fast, right? Because everyone is going to their funding agencies uh, requesting uh, the, the resources that we need to go ahead, right? So um, I don't know if this answers the question in the short term. Again, we have a technically pay schedule, but I, I think we're going to be modulated by ESO quite a bit. Um, I think Mosaic. Um, it's going to go a bit more, uh, you know, a bit more slowly than Andy's, uh, but we have a very clear mandate, and our project manager is pushing very hard to be able to go to Chile around this time and not much later. Uh, mostly, again, as I said, because it's not healthy for a big consortium to spend too much time uh, stuck in different phases, and also because we have commitments by by several partners that they have to spend funding resources before certain years, right? Uh, but uh, again, it, it was a milestone to get ESO to agree on to getting started on the, this phase B. And then the, 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 the big one, as I mentioned, is gonna be this one, the funding review. Again, for people, perhaps, perhaps for the more junior people in the, in the audience, right? Um, uh, the, land, the, 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 the scheme of developing these instruments uh, for the ELT and for ESO in particular, changed dramatically for Andes and Mosaic because up until now, always ESO uh, was the one that was paying for the bulk of the hardware. So the hardware contribution was always uh, brought in, brought by ESO to, to, to the project and the, the, the instruments, the consortia um, brought the effort and perhaps additional hardware if it was needed, right? Um, but ESO changed uh, this this uh, scenario, this this scheme for the second generation instruments, and now the consortia have to raise all the funding, everything, right? The hardware and the effort, and that means that we actually have to demonstrate at this at this review at this milestone that we actually have those fundings secured. We have to have them in the bank, but they have to be identified to be able to go forward. And so you know that is a really tricky situation where you know the funding review. 
you know, if we are at 85%, let's say, in terms of, for example, the hardware uh, contribution, ESO have said, look, we'll, we'll talk, right? Like, you know, ESO might chime in. Um, if we are at 40%, that might be the end of the instrument, right? You know, if you're so far into getting your funding, and the difficult situation, which is where where we are right as as of, as of today, is what happens if you're in between. What if you're at sixty five percent, right? Because there you're far. ESO ESO won't be able to chime in thirty five percent, um, and you're far from delivering. And so that means that per, that's what why I said that perhaps that's where if we find ourselves in the situation, which we hope we won't. Um, we might have to discuss, you know, uh, start start discussing about potential lease scopes uh, of of the instrument, and that's a very nasty situation, right? You, that's at the board level, right? Not not even the the project office, right? But of course, you know, our PI and our PM are working very hard trying to identify resources and partners that can come up with with the, with all the funding needed, so that when we get to the funding review, we're in a good position to to go ahead. Question. I have one. Yeah, of course. Can you say something about the GTO service or yes? Yeah, I I I to be honest, I put together this the, the, the science description of the different science working groups, and I thought I'm gonna put a one one slide on the GTOs, and then I forgot. Uh so the GTOs. Um so uh the organization of the GTOs, as I said, so what we have agreed with ESO right now um is that we get 65 nights uh for the effort contribution. Um, and an amount that is still to be negotiated, but we are pushing to be, to be of the same order. That's why I mentioned 130 nights more or less, but again, that's TV, TVD um, um, for the hardware contribution. But again, it depends on how much we, we provide in the end, how much ESO provides. So that's, we're thinking 130 nights. So the structure of the GTO servers, just to be clear, uh, it was decided by the board that the, the entire uh, time is going to be pooled, right? So it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be IAA gets one night, LAM gets 20 nights, the ATC gets 10 nights. It's not like that, right? It's pooled by all the partners and we go there and we divide, design these surveys, right? Now, how we design, the, design these surveys is the process that we are embarked right now. The idea is that we identify the science working groups. We are identifying key science cases that are unique to Mosaic. Right? What we think is going to be the, the, the killer science in 2035 that only Mosaic will be able to do. Uh, and we start designing surveys that we think uh, will maximize the scientific return of this. Right? So, for example, most likely for the extralactive surveys in particular, several surveys will live in parallel in the same point. Here. Right, because of what Rosa was asking, right, of not being able to do visible and infrared at the same time, right? Most likely we'll do something like, for example, a galaxy, high redshift galaxy survey uh, with the infrared, while at the same time with the invisible, you're doing uh, the Lyman alpha tomography uh, uh, of, again, same fields, because cosmological fields tend to be well known and, and unique, right? But different targets for different size cases that are running in parallel uh, on, on the surveys. Um, now, the exact breakdown of how this service will be designing, there's going to be a ad hoc panel um, that is, is going to be appointed down the line by the board that is going to actually work, take the information that the science working groups and the project scientists uh, provide. And they're going to say, okay, well, you know, respecting more or less uh, this complicated situation about, you know, leadership of contributions, um, these are going to be the main surveys that Mosaic are going to do. And then we're gonna to have to have a discussion on you know who leads what papers, right? So the the, the idea is that we're going, let's say, uh, bottom up. So we first have a pool of very good ideas of what mosaic should do, and then they get progressively progressively distilled into surveys that can work together and that provide a good science return. And we write this thing called the the, the mosaic. It's gonna be the first the red book, and then there's gonna be red book. This, this defines the surveys. Uh, for Mosaic. Um, and the key thing, I think the difficulty, the, to me, the, the main the, the big difficulty is what I mentioned that um, the, the GTO time is going to be spread over eight years, right? And that's a challenge, right? Because, you know, from the time you start to the end, time you end, 
eight years have passed. So how do you, and this is the work that, you know, mostly Matteo and I have to work really hard on, how do you ensure that on your first year, you're doing enough exciting science that you have an impact, right? But that also the stuff you do at the end uh, is impactful and, and it's not just added value, right? This is something just really important that you have only, uh, you can only achieve after 130 nights. So it's it's gonna be, and I guess that's gonna evolve, right? I don't think you know, I don't think the red book and the service are gonna be frozen at the beginning, right? Because you, you you know, as you go, things will change, right? We're talking 2034 for the first line if all goes well, but then the end of the GTO is gonna be 2042, right? So things I guess are gonna be um, um, evolving, and new projects probably will be added to this service. As, as the landscape changes, right? And new data come in and, you know, we're gonna have uh, Lisa and Athena potentially and who knows what, right? So so there's gonna be, there has to be some flexibility built in into, into that process to make sure that the, the service are, are, are impactful. Um, but I don't know if that answers more or less, yeah. uh, but if people have other questions about the GTOs, uh, yeah, feel free to, to ask and so. More questions? So yeah, the, yeah. The, the most junior people in the audience, you're gonna be the ones uh, enjoying uh, this instrument. Uh, so yes. start thinking about it. <laughs> so before thanking again Ruben for his talk, uh, I remind you that at four in the afternoon, uh, he will be in the Sala Polivalente for an informal meeting for those of you who are interested in talking to him about mosaic or your favorite science page. Okay, thank you.